we run out of breakers, we had to swap them around. That's it. He's like, see, he's in the mastermind. That's why he said, he said that's why we had to keep him around because he knows where everything is. <laughs> My wife, she told me, she said, you got to mark every one of these water lines at the ranch just in case something happened to you and, and uh, I wouldn't know where they are. My wife don't know directions from Diddley. She can't very no good at all about direction. But at the ranch I've got I don't know a couple of miles of water lines. They're everywhere, you know, and electrical lines and telephone wire. And so I just tell her, I said, Well, you better take good better care of me. She said, What's gonna happen if something happens to you and how am I gonna fix that? I said, Well you better take better care of me. <laughs> Okay, where was we at? We were talking about booking and, and um, how things have changed with beginning with the barbecue. So I was wondering, I know the surrounding areas have changed a great deal since the 60s, but the actual broken spoke itself, does it still look very much like it did back in the 60s? Yeah, yeah th this building here, I built this broken spoke right here. It's basically 32 by 60. This part right here was in 64. The back from that wall over, that's 1965. And then the outer section, the 66, that's when we put in behind this wall also, 66. And our storeroom, we added that storeroom, that was in uh, in 65 uh, because we, and we just threw it together. I didn't have no um, storeroom and I didn't, you know, if I had to do all over again, I'd have probably put bigger restrooms and a lot different maybe. But it is what it is, you know. It's kind of the charm of the place, you know. The low ceiling and and uh, the whole the whole thing, even like the women's restroom. I mean, that's, that's shower curtains. And <laughs> but the door won't work, you know. Just that we we were packed back there, and that's about all we had room for was that size restroom. But if I'd had to do over again, I'd have probably had like another commode in the women's and I'd have a, where you have, a, you know, more of a privacy thing. But we used to have shower curtains that were little animals, like elephants yeah. and uh, giraffes. And that's when they were smoking back in the 60s. And so the women, they'd take their cigarette when they was in the restroom and they would burn little holes in the animals then they'd burn like J plus C or something like that, you know. And my wife would get so mad because they'd screwing up the shower curtain, plastic shower curtain. They're just drunk putting out their cigarettes. Yeah. <laughs> so then, then one night, somebody stole the damn shower curtain. I don't know how the hell they stole them when it's open, you know. They stole them. I guess they wanted to take them home with them. <laughs> That's funny. Did you... Envision it becoming so the broken spoke becoming so successful. <clears throat> you know, I, I never really thought about that, and I think it's it's a proudness to me that it is famous, and uh, I thrive. It's a quest for me to make it more famous, and I'm more of a promoter than a salesman. I mean, I'm not a kind of guy that go knocking on door, 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 trying to sell you something. But I know when people come in the broken spoke, they want something to drink, you know. It's easy, it just sells itself, you know. But I, I promote the broken spoke. I, I give a lot of talks and a lot of interviews and whatever I can. And uh, I never tell anybody any lie. I'm gonna tell them the truth of what we stand for. And when I get up there and I say, you know, we got cold beer and good whiskey and good looking girls to dance with, that's the fact. And when I also tell them, you know, we ain't got no hanging fern baskets, no gray poop on, you know, or Pierre water, I mean, that's the fact. I, I never could, uh, when I walk in a grocery store, I've said it so many times, I can't stop in front of a gray poop on jar and I can't stop in front of uh, some Pierre water in the beverage <laughs> department because I might lose my image. <laughs> Whatever image I've got, you know, it's it's there. And I, I've had people try to jokingly give me a bottle of Pierre water. They give me a hanging fern, and I just 
won't accept it or I'll, I'll just drop it in the nearest trash can. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> they did it to me one birthday, just for a joke, yeah. you know. And with I was on stage, you got 500 Bring people. Caviar or something. And they, yeah. They'd come up with a fern basket, and then they come with a pier of water and a grapefruit pond. I just threw it all in the trash. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what uh, got you into the bedazzled uh, country, uh, cowboy shirts and the suits? I love it. You pull it off well. Well, I, I like the uh, bling bling shirts, and um, I'm very honored that this year the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville is going to have one of my bling bling shirts and one of my hats on display. Uh, well, it'll be this month, May the 25th in Nashville. I'm going up the 24th for a VIP. It's going to be an exhibit all about Austin in the 70s to include the musicians that played in Austin back in those days and also uh, to uh, talk about when all the hippies came to town in the 70s. And uh, of course, Willie Nelson, he's, he's number one. When he came right here, he was clean shaven. And he started going over with the, the country, uh, western, uh, hardcore, halfway redneck guys. But then he also went over real big with all the hippies because the hippies, up until that time, we always considered a concert was something like an orchestra, sit down, listen to orchestra music. But now, you know, a concert is just any kind of event that they've got wherever it is, outside or inside. And it's a listening type thing where I've always preferred uh, the dance hall, honky tonk style, and not just a, a concert. I don't really want a concert at the Broken Spoke. I want people to get up and and dance and and talk and you know get up and go to the restroom when they want to, and not have to say excuse me sir or whatever you know. I'm, or have somebody say, shh, be quiet. You know, someone's so saying. <laughs> like golf? It blows my mind at sporting events that you can't be loud. Oh, yeah, oh, golf. Yeah, you can't say nothing. Yeah. <laughs> so Real quiet. <laughs> I, speaking of dance, I saw, and I remember hearing about it, Garth Brooks. I adored him as a little girl. How yeah. did that come to play? Well, I was very excited when Garth Brooks, I heard that he was going to come here. And uh, my daughter was talking to those people. And I told her, I said, let's don't, my daughter Jenny, I said, let's don't let this slip through her fingers. And uh, so I met with the people up here, his handlers, and we knew uh, maybe a couple weeks ahead of time, and then we kind of knew for certain a week ahead of time. And uh, they said he wanted it to be a surprise, so not to tell anybody. And so I didn't. And uh, I know my even one of my granddaughters got mad because she didn't know about it. And my banker got mad because he didn't know but about it. But then you know they would have told that one person who would have told oh, that yeah. one person. Because it's big news. Yeah. It's juicy. And so we there's going to be 40 people from Amazon, all the big shots. I get, they're such big shots with Amazon that they had their own bodyguards. And then Garth Book people was another 40 people. And one of his managers and all his handlers and booking agents and all. But he was extremely a nice guy. He was right on time when he's supposed to be. And and I'm a big Garth Brooks fan because of him coming out here because I, he had never been here before. And I think that's one of the reasons why he wanted to be here. And uh, he's the one that more or less said, uh, well, it's on his, when he tweeted or texted or whatever, he said, uh, I'm in Austin, Texas, the live music capital of the world. I cannot spend Friday night in my hotel room. I might just go out. And then he had a picture of a wagon wheel. <laughs> and so then that was kind of a clue. And so that's a clue, you know. And so then he ended up uh, coming out, and he couldn't have been nicer to us. And he's very complimentary. And I talked to him a long time outside. And I said, well, you ready for me to introduce you? I said, okay, if I introduce you. And he said, yep, go up there and say whatever you want to. And uh, he said, oh, we, we can sit out here and talk some more, you know, whatever you want to do. It's very friendly. And so when I got up on stage, the word had got out that he was coming. 
and I guess we had five, six hundred people, and it was all swarmed around the stage yeah. and uh, with their cell phones up in the air. <laughs> and anyway, it was an exciting moment. And then when I I introduced the band, similar to just about every one of them, I, I changed a few things. But with him, I just said one of the best things that ever happened was uh, when a young man from Oklahoma came in to big a little tree and walked across the old dirt parking lot. And through the door open on this red rustic old building, uh, knowing damn good well he wasn't at Carnegie Hall. Let's make a welcome, Garth Brooks. And so it was a big deal for me. And uh, But then I couldn't get off the stage. So I just stood on the stage the whole 45 minutes that he was on the stage, him and his guitar. He had one guy, one bodyguard, and he had one guy that was uh, his uh, guitar tuner. Kind of took care of the equipment. And uh, he didn't really have that much equipment. Billy Mata was the band they had that night. And it was set up with him that he'd take a break at quarter to 11 and I'd bring Garth Brooks on. So that's what we did. And uh, anyway, it's one of the moments you never forget. And so then he ended up, at the end of it, everybody, they paid him respect. They didn't try to mob the stage when they probably could have it. It would have screwed it up. Just like I kept it a secret because I'm thinking, well, it'd be a disaster if I told somebody. And what if he couldn't even get here himself? You know, like if they blocked the driveway somehow, then the whole thing is, bust, would, yeah. would be a bust. Yeah. So anyway, at the end of it, unexpected to me, he just turned around and he handed me his, uh, his guitar and he said, this is for you. So that's how I got the guitar. It was something that... Uh, I guess it was a good thing I stayed on the stage, and uh, but he was very nice about that. So now I'm, I've got the guitar hanging uh, right over my father's uh, silver saddle over here, this, this case. Oh, that's your dad's? Yeah. That's my dad's silver saddle, and Garth Brooks' guitar hangs over it, and that's when he's played the broken spoke, and I kid people, I got some of Garth's DNA, because every time he would pick his guitar and he'd, he'd like to clap and get the crowd going then he would put the pick in his mouth see, and then he'd pick some more so anyway i said well we got his picking on <laughs> um so and that thing went all over and they talked about it for two days on the air oh that the next fun. day there was that auditorium shores on town lake but we got all we had all the magic here because we upstaged the city of Austin on their presentation because we got the press and that was very good. What's been some of your favorite press and media coverage over the years? Like I saw the book with Donna Miller and then you've been in some TV shows. What's been kind of, I guess, the most exciting? Well, the uh, the movie was exciting, Honky Tonk Heaven. That movie was by Brenda Mitchell. She's a director and producer. And uh, we became real good friends over these last, it's been about four years now. It took three years for the book, took three years for the movie. And we're still taking it to places all over. And uh, we just got back from a, a real good show at the State Fairgrounds of Texas. And uh, that was uh, at the State Museum. And uh, it went over really well. And uh, they put us up in a, a hotel there in, in uh, Dallas. And then also I got to go to TCU with uh, the book tour at the library on campus for TCU just recently. And then we, we, have to let, we went back to Smithfield again just recently and went over real good in Smithfield. And so we showed the film again down there. And we showed the film all around Texas. And one trip we took it from, from Austin to Dallas to Nashville to Dubuque, Iowa. And then we came back home. But it was very good to hit all them spots. And then they wanted me to go to Amsterdam with the movie. But my wife said it's too damn cold over there. And uh, I, I think. It's also too smoky for me over there. <laughs> a lot of smoke. That's true. But anyway, it went over real good in Amsterdam. That's cool. That's Very good. And they had a big time. Made it all the way to the Netherlands. Honky Tonk Heaven went all the way there. And then just recently, 
Just the other night, we were on that that uh, Real South. It's a TV show, and they showed the whole movie. Then I think they showed a little of uh, other things about the spoke or talk about it. And I wanted to tape that thing, and I never did get to tape it. I'm sure you can find it now with a re I don't know. I, I have. You could find it, Bobby. I don't the know. The one that, the recent, yeah, I'm You sure. can find it. Yeah, I'll look for it. Um, let's see. Okay, so how did you, Dale Watson, I see him on the marquee all the time. How did you find Dale? Well, Dale's been coming around here for a lot of years. He did his music video um, south of Round Rock, Texas out here. That's where they did different scenes like on the top of her roof and out underneath the oak tree. And and Dale has got such a beautiful voice and uh, good country good country voice. And he's got a lot of energy. And uh, he was just here Saturday night. We had a big night. And... Uh, He's, he's got a shot at a lot of different shows coming up, and they he did some commercials for different people. And it's going very good for him. That's good. And uh, he, he can get out and tour. Sometimes he does like three gigs a day, which is pretty damn good. Yeah. A lot. A lot. And he can get he can do it. And uh, but he's got his tour bus, and. Uh, I like Celine, uh, his new girlfriend, Celine, is a very good hard worker, great country singer, and they do that duet together, duet, and I, I like to hear them singing up there. Yeah. They're good friends of mine. They they want us to go on a cruise with them, call it like a Dale Watson Broken Spoke cruise, but my wife, she's not much on cruises, I think, but they want my daughter, Terry, to dance, teach people how to dance, and get them doing it like they do here. Then they wanted me to get up there and sing some songs with them. Then they wanted my wife to be there also. But I don't know if uh, that's next year. We'll have to think about that. Understood. So this ventriloquist saw with the cowboy hat, uh, what's the story behind oh, that? Oh, he's not really a ventriloquist. Right? Oh, he don't say nothing. Yeah, oh, he don't yeah. say nothing. <laughs> but... <clears throat> Rowdy was going to be my bus driver when I had the bus over there. And, uh, but I set him right there, and he don't want to leave the bar area now. And he takes pictures with all the girls that come out here. And uh, he's very, he's kind of a ladies' man. And uh, he's, his skull is kind of cracked now because people keep dropping him on something. Or some drunk wants to dance with him and move him around, and it, his knuckles is broke off here, I think. And one time I used to write a newsletter, and uh, I just I talk about Rowdy like he's a real person, you know, like a living thing, you know. And Rowdy, that's his name, like his name is Rowdy. Okay. And I talk about Rowdy like he's a. Uh, when people ask me, say, "Well, where'd you get him?" I said, "Well." I picked him up hitchhiking out on 620, so I gave him a ride to the Broken Spoke, and now he don't want to leave the bar. He's here 24/7. And uh, <laughs> but when I pull up the stoplights and people would look over at him, it's kind of I never would do nothing. I just look straight ahead. I, I knew they was looking at him. And, like, but, is that yeah. a dummy? Or is that a, a very stoic man? Yeah. That's hilarious. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, he's he's a funny guy, but. When they stole my dad's silver saddle right there, that's the only thing funny in the whole thing was that it took me 14 days to get the saddle back. But the first cop on the scene, he crawled in the same window as the burgers did. And they came in and he said, uh, I almost shot Rowdy. <laughs> and I said, I wish you would have because it, it looked kind of cool with some powder burns on it. You know? but, Anyway, uh, but he sat there and didn't say nothing. He let him steal the saddle. But they, uh, Rowdy, one time when he broke his knuckles off, we was going to glue him back on. And so I'm writing about it in this newsletter like he's a person. I said, oh, hell, somebody broke off a couple of Rowdy's fingers, and they fell on the floor, and, uh, and the waitress swept him up. I thought it was the Bill Pickle and, and threw it in the dumpster. And so, <laughs> so then... <laughs> Uh, when I heard about it, I had to send the waitress out to retrieve his 
fingers <laughs> out of the dump so we could glue them back on. And and this waitress's uh, sister in a different city, what kind of place are you working at? Says, wrote her letter, says, you got some guy that breaks his fingers off and y'all throw him in the dumpster. And, and she thought it was a real story. You know? Was this a real newsletter person? that you would write for the broken spoke? Yeah. That's hilarious. That someone actually thought it was. Yeah. And to that sister, what kind of place are you working at? You know? It's a dummy. <laughs> So I guess my last question as we wrap up this interview is about the Hall of Fame and just time and nostalgia. Whenever I walk in there, it's very nostalgic to me. You can see all the time and all the different happy faces and the gigs. Is it, I was going to say, you know, uh, what's been the most rewarding, uh, I guess, other than it seems like you met your quest, you sought it out, you conquered the quest, so I know that that was the, the initiative, but looking back in time, is it easy to get kind of that bittersweet nostalgia for the past, or is it more of like a, you know, I guess, a, a kind of the start, I guess, a, kind of talking about Willie Nelson talks about stardust memories and how we glamorize, is it easy to get lost in time when you're here, is there so much work going on that there's not a lot of time to think about the past? Well, you know, this is kind of this place like a two-step back in time. When you, when you, when people walk in here for the first time, they can't believe it. They say, "Well, this is like going back in a time capsule." It seems like you're you come in here and you're back in the 40s and the 50s. Because I built this place to look like the 40s and the 50s, because that was my day. I, I grew up in the 50s. I mean, I, you know, the class of 57. That was my class. We had a dream, but. I never dreamed it was going to be this good, you know, but anyway, it's it's a fun life. But I I think one of the, about the best, I never did tell you about, the, I think it was probably the best one piece of publicity we ever got was when um, Texas Highway called me up back in 1990 and they said, well, we want to come out and film you and Alvin Crow in front of your Cadillac with a broken spoke in the background. So we got out here and they took some pictures and then they went back to Texas Highway. Then he called me, he said, well, we want to get some better pictures. He says, we voted you the best honky tonk in Texas and we want to get a very good picture. So the one picture of me and it made the back cover of Texas Highway. That's a three hour photo shoot. And that's one of the best things. And then inside with the story of what was the best 10 top honky-tonks in Texas. And we were number one. And so the publisher himself came out here. And they had like three umbrella lights. They had synchronized lights in the Cadillac on the porch inside. And it was very good. But now with that one picture, that's when I started... I guess doing more photo shoots than ever before and more people want my picture, more people autograph autograph that thing. And up until then, you know, the cell phones wasn't that hot, you know, but but that it kind of started it, you know. And they had like a distribution of 400,000. And uh, when you get the grown men say, well, you know, I've got your picture over my bed at home, you know, or on my wall or wherever it is. And it, it's a heart thing, it feel, you feel good about it, you know. And uh, it's, and then today, I mean, I take more pictures than I've ever taken in my life before. I tell people, I say, hell, in 1964, ain't nobody wanted my picture, but if they want it now, I'll make up for a long time. But uh, if there were fun times in the 60s and everything was new. And I just had so much fun, you know, here at the spoke. But I think that one thing that we did with Texas Highway, and now it's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving. Right now, we're on every roadside park in Texas at the rest stops. And you, you come in, there's a picture of the broken spoke, and me and Alvin and the Cadillac and the spoke. Always be and then, then on the left, there's the state capitol. I mean, it's right there, you know. And they typify that as being, uh, you got music, you got Texas, and you know you got the broken spoke. It's a very good compliment to us. And since then, we've been voted the best country dance all in the nation, home of the best ticket fight steak in town, and uh, 
just all the Meripolitan Award winner. Well, we've had a lot of awards, but I've been I got two of the Texas Hall of Fame already, and I'm in the Smithsonian. I'm in the. That's big. It is big. I'm in the Smithsonian. I'm in the Country Music Hall of Fame, and um, it's um, very good. I never expected it. All I really wanted was a, was a honky tonk dance hall. That's what I wanted. You know? So I got what I wanted, but then I got a lot more than what I wanted. You know? And which is fine because it's it's fun. It's fun to have people. They have a lot more fun to have people brag about you than and to bitch about <laughs> what happened. You know, it's always true. more fun to get compliments. Than a bad review. That is true. Well, thank you so much for your time. And if there's, it's, no, it's I, fun. I, You're fun to talk to. Very good girl. Thank you, Mr. White. <laughs> well, I hope you do good and. <clears throat>